Welcome everybody back into Nerd Sesh. As always, I'm Carson Bradburn and alongside me is Logan Camden and we've got some big NFL news to discuss today. Stefan Diggs traded from my Buffalo Bills to the Houston Texans, but that's going to be later because it's NBA season and we just had a pretty awesome night of NBA action. Lots of big significant games to discuss and we have to start, Logan, with the dream matchup it feels like in today's NBA, Wemby Jokic. Last time we saw him, it was fascinating, it was thrilling, and last night delivered in a big way. Jokic hangs 40 Wemby comes dangerously close to a quadruple double. What did you take away from watching these two go to battle? Dream matchup is exactly how I would characterize it, Carson. I mean, my big takeaway was this feels like it could be a consistent playoff rivalry one day or anytime these two match up. I mean, you're looking at maybe the two perennial MVP candidates every single year. Like, it really feels like the apprentice going up against the master you know what i mean the guy who's gonna carry the next totem like i don't know if i could ask for a more perfect basketball matchup man like it's just it's like everything you could want as a basketball fan Wow, Carson, you got dangerously cross-eyed right there, man. That was kind of freaky. <laughs> I'm cutting that. I wasn't going to be on frame for that. I had to pull a hair off of my hat. <laughs> Dude, that was spooky, man. Yeah, I didn't know you could do that. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> a couple of episodes ago, we talked about when will Wemby uh, cross these different thresholds. And I thought we were going to see it. I mean, Wemby is two assists and a block away from getting a quadruple double. Like, mm-hmm. he is just... I also, dude, I don't know if I've ever seen anyone that just, like, exponentially improves from game to game like Wemby. Like, he's just, I don't, he just feels like he adds something different to his bag every single game. He's so smooth. But this really was like a battle of the Titans going up against each other, even down to the buzzer. Like, in the middle of the game, it felt like Jokic had finally figured out with some of these crazy touch shots where... It was remarkable, man, where Jokic's, like, release point was, it it was weird. Like, he counteracted where he normally changes his release point on these hooks and layups and tough shots so he could get them over Wemby's wingspan. Like, that was an in-game change he made. And then later in the game, down to the buzzer, it didn't matter where Wemby had adjusted and was back to stuffing a couple of Jokic shots. He completely stifles Reggie Jackson uh, on that floater towards the end, which is just like... It just felt like your little brother drive into the rack. And it was like, come on, man. Get out of here with that weak stuff. Not me. My little Uh, brother is more than six foot three and much better at basketball than me. And you don't have a little brother. I don't have a little brother. so. (laughs) But you guys can imagine it. Yeah. Imagine it. (laughs) If you do have a little brother, it's probably what it was like, you know. Um, But it was just watching the master go to work, man. It was... I'm not a big Star Wars guy, man. But it was like Obi-Wan and Anakin, you know. It was the... Mm the master versus the apprentice and uh Jokic ends up prevailing uh you know just his control over the game his mastery his playmaking uh his scoring all of it and it was weird because in that final stretch I thought the Spurs had a great defensive game plan dialed up now it's not going to work every time because they were just throwing doubles and anytime Jokic touched the rock it was we need to get the ball out of his hands and the rest of the Nuggets went offense went cold during that final stretch that's why the Spurs were able to crawl back in that game like the Nuggets quite literally just could not hit an open shot but uh the Nuggets slammed the door Uh, my big takeaway is just I mean this is the premier battle in the NBA I think for the next five to ten years it feels like and it's going to be the uh, for me it's going to be the passing of the torch you know one day it's when does Wemby finally surpass and, and get the master and when does Wemby take over as the lead guy this kind of feels like the I don't know, the two faces of the league right now, um, you know, the, the face of the league right now and the face of the future. And I'm just excited for every time these two are going to do battle because it is, it, it, to me, it's the two battle of the Titans, the two battles of, of what what is going to be the leading MVP candidates year in, year out, man. Uh, it is not disappointed. It is not going to disappoint. Uh, it is must-watch TV every single time out. But uh, the master handles business for right now, man, but, Damn, did Wemby put on a show, dude. It's I couldn't I couldn't conceive of a better battle, man. He sure did put on a show. And 
he is the most fascinating matchup for Jokic in the league mm-hmm. right now because we talk about how Jokic has solved offense. It feels like he's solved half-court offense every single game. He's just going to pick you apart with such efficient shot making and perfect decision as a playmaker. And then there's this one dude who's seven foot four with an eight foot wingspan, and he changes Jokic's approach more dramatically than anybody else can. We saw it last time that they met. I made a whole video breakdown about how Jokic was deliberately spacing the floor, first of all, to try to limit how aggressively Wemby could help and blow things up as a roamer, but then also was very aggressively like sprinting into the lane when he would catch these balls at the three-point line and then putting up these floaters and touch shots before Wemby could affect him. And Jokic was devastatingly effective like that, but it's not really a formula that anybody else can replicate because nobody else is going to shoot 65% on those floaters so that was a very interesting chess match and in this one we saw Jokic again do whatever he could to avoid having to deal with Wemby's length in those straight up one-on-one settings now he did post up more in this game and he found some success there he's just so much stronger and when he can create a little separation for the hook with uh, a bump then his touch there is just so unbelievable but again it was about him finding ways to navigate Wemby's length and we particularly saw this with him getting out in transition early in the game especially Jokic was sprinting down the floor Wemby is an incredibly agile big and offensively scores more in transition than like any other big in basketball but Jokic I think is underrated for how smart he is in certain matchups about making sure that he's beating guys down the floor it doesn't matter if maybe they're more athletic he's just gonna run harder and so he got some easy buckets doing that that being said If he didn't execute that perfectly, and particularly you saw that I can think of two instances in which he dunked the ball in those transition situations, because if he doesn't have multiple steps and he goes for a classic Jokic layup, Wendy's going to block that shit. And that's what happened one of the times where Jokic beat him down the floor, but he just erased that advantage with his length. The other thing that Jokic was doing to really capitalize on these easy opportunities was second chance scoring. He had eight points off of offensive rebounds in this game and just held Wemby accountable for chasing a couple blocks a little bit. Wemby is an unbelievable defender. I think he can be the greatest defensive player of all time. He's already the best defensive playmaker in the sport, but I do think there is truth to the fact that his block numbers may go down a bit as he improves defensively just because he comes a bit more disciplined. And there were a couple spots where he took himself out of position trying to make a remarkable play, and then Jokic was able to clean up on the glass. So that's the thing about anybody dealing with Wemby. Yes, Jokic had his wins one-on-one, and he showed those super quick touch finishes, and he had some really nice plays out of the post. But the name of the game against Wemby is how effectively can you stay away from Wemby and score? How can you impact the game without having this seven foot four man with an eight foot wingspan just erase every opportunity you have? And that's what Jokic is so phenomenal at because he doesn't have to score at the rim because of his incredible touch shot making and because the guy is just so damn smart. And you're really rewarded for being decisive against Wemby right you make that one strong move to create space for that hook shot if you're Jokic you should put it up because there's a spot in this game where he actually has a good look if he took it a hook shot but he goes for the up and under to the left and Wemby just erases it like the guy is an absolute freak Reggie Jackson learned the hard way not to try him you mentioned that floater that barely got out of his hands Wemby just met him at the apex I mean looked like the Statue of Liberty He had another one where he just erased Reggie coming from the opposite side of the paint. It's ridiculous. But the other thing that was so impressive from Wemby this game, on top of the nine blocks, was the eight assists. He had some super impressive moments as a scorer in this game. He also missed a whole lot of shots. He was 9 of 29 in this game, missed a lot of jumpers in particular. But what he was doing as a passer early in this game, running inverted pick and roll, where you cannot switch those actions because you are not going to leave KCP or Reggie Jackson or any of those guys on an island with Wemby because simply put, if they are on him one-on-one, he can shoot over them and that is a completely uncontested shot. So what you basically have to do is hedge and then have uh, the screen defender, who in this case is a guard, fight back to their man. And so that means that for a little split second, 
oftentimes those guards could pop because they're going to be threats as a shooter. In this case, early in the game, they were rolling where the screen defender, the guard, is going to be trailing their man. And in those situations, Wemby did an excellent job of dissecting those coverages with playmaking, hit a couple of really nice bounce passes with perfect timing, taking advantage of those four on threes. And that's just ridiculous that a big can command that sort of coverage from the perimeter and then execute it with such sound decision making as a 20 year old like that is the stuff with Wemby where it's just like okay he's bigger than everybody he's longer than everybody but the skill in the passing IQ really is remarkable he also had some really impressive transition passes in this game had one outlet pass that he actually overthrew by like maybe a foot so they didn't get a bucket out of it but it was like a 70 foot pass that was very nearly perfect and you see stuff like that you just see the awareness to push the tempo with these hit ahead passes and his playmaking ceiling is so high we've seen it continually throughout the season he's become more involved there better there he averaged almost five assists a game last month but that to me was every bit as press impressive as what he did defensively and really the one criticism you have of Wemby this game was uh, settling just taking a lot of tough jumpers and I think particularly you saw him struggle with physicality down the stretch with Aaron Gordon on him that's a guy who's just not going to be capable of moving and so he takes a couple tough jumpers there was even a post up where he had Justin Holiday, which is obviously a very favorable switch but Holiday battled him bumped him off his spots and then he takes a little bit of a tougher runner so that's the one thing with Wemby that's going to be physical maturity and also just having better playmakers and ball handlers who make life easy on him like Wemby isn't supposed to have to be your primary perimeter initiator, which in this game, he really was. I mean, he was carrying the load from the perimeter as a playmaker and a scorer. It's just those tough jumpers aren't all good looks, and they weren't falling super consistently in this game. But it's an unbelievable performance from both these guys. It is, I legitimately think, the most fun matchup in basketball right now because you have the smartest player and the best offensive player and maybe the strongest player, the best touch shot maker, against the most athletically gifted player, the most gifted defensive player. What an incredibly fun contrast, In watching them go to battle is just so exciting, and really generational stuff. I hope that Jokic sticks around long enough and doesn't get bored and tired of basketball, because I want to see these two colliding at their absolute peak. Wemby has an opportunity to disrupt Jokic, in a way that nobody else on the planet can, particularly if he adds strength, which he will, and can physically contend in that sense more in these post-up situations, so it's not all about length, like Jokic isn't just going to be able to move him, bump him around kind of at will, it's absolutely terrifying how dominant this man can be, and could be like the one counter on the planet for this unstoppable offensive player. And we're already seeing that he has those tools as a rookie, but yes, right now, Jokic is winning out these battles. I completely agree. And I think it really is remarkable that Wemby's this far along. I mean, he is the deterrent to Jokic that we've been waiting on. I, I'm i going to feel shortchanged as a fan if we don't get that, man. I, I want to I wanna see them collide in the playoffs. And I want the Spurs... You know, this has kind of been my feeling for a while, but, like, you know, I know that Wemby needs to be the number one here, but... And you don't want to accelerate the timeline too fast, but I want the Spurs to get as good as possible as fast as possible because mm -hmm. I just think Wemby can be your guy immediately. And it's like... Yeah. And you're talking about those possessions where, like, Jokic gets up and down the floor, um, you know, and just gasses them. There's nobody else in San Antonio that's also, like, as smart as Wemby, too. It's like nobody else is picking up on that defensive assignment in transition going, hey, Wemby just scored a layup at the other end. Jokic is accelerating to the other end of the floor to beat him. I need to pick him up. I need to slide right now so Wemby has an extra second just to recover because there was one where that was you could see Wemby's frustration on his face where he was like, I saw him running down the court the entire time. He's very close to getting that block. Jokic literally beats him by one step and it's and you, you know I don't know he like throws his fist in frustration or something like that and it's like somebody else in San Antonio has to realize hey I gotta pick I gotta tag Jokic on that play and make sure he doesn't have an untracked area to the rim the Spurs just outside of Wemby are so far away from contention just like well, with just 
And they also were down so many guys in this game. Don't mm -hmm. have Sohan. Don't have Keldon Johnson. Don't have I Devin mean, Vassell. And that's part of what's so insanely impressive about this game. This is in Denver, and it's like, yeah, the Nuggets don't have Jamal Murray, but Wemby doesn't have any of his starters other than Trey Jones. And, uh, and even also, with this off shooting night, I mean, if Wemby had a good shooting yeah, night, they dude, win. It would have been the best game of his career, and he's already done some crazy stuff, but there were so many special moments defensively in playmaking, and when he did score, some of those moments are nasty. I mean, he has, like, the lefty scoop finish over yeah. Jokic out of inverted pick and roll. He hits the step back three in transition. He's just a freak, man. I mean, what is there even to say? He's incomprehensible. The fluidity is stupid. It doesn't make any sense. Even with those starters, though, man, it's like that's the guys that Wemby's dealing with. Like, San yeah, Antonio. there's a big difference. Yeah, I mean, it's a big difference, but it's still Keldon Johnson. It's still Jeremy Sohan. It's, I like Devin Vassell. I, I think Devin Vassell's a winner, but it's like, can, can, let's accelerate the timeline, San Antonio. Let's step on the pedal. Let's get, let's get some winners in here, or just at least some guys that can help Wemby play defense, man. Uh, I'm excited, because whenever San Antonio plans to press that button, they're going to be in the playoffs, and they're going to be really damn competitive, because they got Wemby, and... I believe in him. I'm, I'm just excited for that prospect, man. I think a playoff series between those two would be basketball heaven, man. Yeah, it'd be unbelievable. So much fun to watch. And you mentioned that we had that conversation about when will Wemby do these various things? One of them was when will he get a quadruple double? You said next year. I think I said early in his third year. I think it's going to happen next year. I don't know, dude. I mean, he was Wemby just, knocking Wemby just, on the door here. Let me just does it the next week, you know? He could, dude. <laughs> he legitimately could. That's the thing. This is what we've talked about. Week after week, month after month, he finds a way to move the bar from a starting point of best prospect since LeBron bar none. You can't even have a serious conversation that says otherwise. That was the starting point. And then he has continually gotten significantly more impressive and throughout the year. And now the bar is, is he going to be the greatest player in NBA history? That's the bar. Literally. I think that is the bar. I remember before the year, Chris Broussard said, if this guy is an Akeem Olajuwon level, level player, that'd be a disappointment. And I was like, what a ridiculous thing to say. It's one of the 12 greatest players ever. You can't hold anybody to, this, to that standard. There's not a single prospect you can hold to that standard. Even LeBron, if he was a top 12 player of all time, People wouldn't have been disappointed. If he was an all-star, people would have been disappointed, like just a regular old all-star. But if he was an MVP of the league and the best player on two title teams with limited help, nobody would say, oh, what an underwhelming career. And I still don't think that that's true, that Wemby would be a disappointment if he had an Akeem Olajuwon level career. But I'll tell you one thing, man. The expectation now is like that he's going to do that, if not more. It's just... Uh, unfathomable i keep using the same words incomprehensible unreal because it is i've never seen anything like wemby and it is already so great seeing how he forces the best offensive player and the best player on the planet to adjust his approach but Jokic did win out in this game denver did win out in this game very fun the other big story logan was joel Embiid returning to action didn't have Maxi out there. He only played 29 minutes, played a shorthanded OKC team without SGA or Jalen Williams. But Philly picked up a win. How much of a threat are they with Embiid back out there on the floor? Philly's interesting. They're a... Uh, we were we're going to do our contender ranking soon. And so I, I was pondering this exact question. I mean, I think they're a top 10 contender. Now, that's not saying a whole lot. You know, like, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way to Philly, but, you know, they're among the Miami Heat of the world to me. They're, they're among the, you know, the back end of, of the competitive teams. Close to Milwaukee, that Miami range. I, Embiid, Embiid obviously changes things. I think you see this in, in his first game back. Like, Embiid opens up so much just... Everything on the floor is so much easier because he commands so much attention from the defense. Like, he just does. And I, it's just evident. Uh, he puts up 24 points, 6 boards, 7 assists on 6 of 14 shooting. Uh, he goes 0 of 3 from deep, 12 of 12 from the line with 3 steals. Uh, yeah, I mean, DHOs, uh, pick and rolls, like just little actions that open up so many easy opportunities and shots for his teammates. Again, along with... 
guys falling asleep on the back end because you have to. You got to help off Embiid, man. He torches single coverage. Uh, the mid range J looked good. I, you mentioned he only plays 29 minutes per game. I thought the stamina and conditioning looked pretty solid from Embiid. The one area where I'm still really concerned is with the playmaking. He has six turnovers in this game. Deals with some double teams poorly. The, the bigger issue I had with uh, Embiid offensively in this one in his return was just telegraphing some of his passes. Like, sometimes he just takes too long to get it out of his hands. Where, like, he'll hold it above his hands. And, you know, normally he's so big and strong, it doesn't matter. Guys don't normally have time to get their hand in the passing lanes. But the Thunder aren't a team that, you know... It, you know, just let off the gas defensively. And Embiid telegraphed a lot of these passes. They got poked loose. I'm still scared about that. I'm still scared about him and his jump shot, you know, failing. Again, it's just, it's a matter of he's been away from the game for a long time now. Like, and it's just a matter of him getting back up to game speed with a week to go. It's a really hard thing to ask of a guy. I don't care who you are. If you're a superstar, if you're a role player, it's really hard to ask a guy in a week or two to get fully ready for the playoffs. I mean, mm-hmm. you saw the greatest player of all time, Michael Jordan, went and played baseball, came back, uh, what was it, before the 95 season? Uh, during come, the 95 season. Yeah, during the 95 season, comes back with a few weeks left, and they get bounced by Orlando in in the playoffs. So it's... I don't think Philly has a championship ceiling. I don't think Philly Mm -hmm. has a real shot at making it out of the East. I don't think Philly has a real shot at winning the title. It's just really hard to ask a superstar player, any player for that matter, to come back on this short of notice and to get back to full game speed. Especially a player like Joel Embiid, when we've seen he's had his own inconsistencies in the playoffs. And I think they may rear their ugly head if his jump shot wanes, if he sputters playmaking. I'm not going to hold it crazily against Embiid. I know what Joel Embiid is. I know how he commands the game. I know what he does on the basketball court. He's one of the best players on planet Earth. And so I'm not going to hold the fact that he's not going to be back up full at 100%. Uh, It's encouraging. Obviously, Philadelphia is better with him on the floor. It's ridiculous Mm -hmm. to say that they're not. Um, You know, but I'm not moved. And I... I'm not going to hold it too much against Embiid if, if he's not perfect in this year's playoffs or the Sixers don't do crazy things. I, I, I mm-hmm. think we can confidently evaluate and know what Embiid is, is like at this point. And his shortcomings are what they are, and his strengths are what they are. I will say this. If Embiid does find it, I mean, he is still a guy that can wreck a first-round series. He is still a guy that can oh, completely yeah. wreck a series. Like, if he is on... Uh, weaponizing his physicality, if his jumper is falling. I mean, again, you see it in this one where the mid-range pull-ups, it's just like it's unstoppable when that thing's hitting, man. Uh, The one thing that I'm pretty mad about announcers is that can we stop calling Jalen Williams the other Jalen Williams? Can we come up with another nickname for him or something, man? It just infuriates me on the broad. It just feels so disrespectful to a guy when we're consistently calling him the other Jalen Williams. Well, man. he it's does just... have a nickname. They call the other Jalen Williams, meaning J A L E N, J. They call him J Dub. They call him J Will. So can the announcers get the memo? Can can we call him J Will? It's just it's it's frustrating. Sure, man. Why don't you write a petition? Um, write a letter. I, it just feels feels really disrespectful when when we're doing that, man. He's. He's well, Jalen Williams, Well, you know Williams what? Maybe too. they shouldn't have taken two guys in the same draft <laughs> that's named Jalen Williams. That's, that's very fair. That's my take on it all. Yeah, this was an interesting debut from Embiid. And when you talk about him and his playoff resume, obviously at some point he has to prove that his game can translate at the same level. And I have been very critical of him for his playoff shortcomings. At the same time, this year, given the context of this already relatively accelerated turn from a meniscus for a guy who historically has massive injury issues carrying a huge burden in this situation like if he doesn't deliver this year in the playoffs and if through these next two weeks leading up he doesn't look like the Joel Embiid that we saw for the first 35 games of the season where he was averaging 35 a night and scoring 40 and 50 seemingly at will then obviously we need to apply that context and we can't hold it against him in the same way that we have years past. And honestly, I probably wouldn't hold it much against him at all because he did look different in this game. First of all, slimmer than I've seen him in years. Nick Nurse talked about the fact that he went out there and lost some weight. 
I would like to know how much weight, because that was literally the first thing I noticed turning on this game. This looked like a much younger Joel Embiid, and uh, he didn't look fully comfortable yet coming back from this injury, which isn't surprising in his first game back, but it was a very jump-shooting heavy performance. He only took one shot inside of 10 feet, and to be fair, there are some physical drives that aren't recorded on the stat sheet because basically every time that he engaged in a physical drive, he got fouled. He took 12 free throws in this game against just 14 shots. OKC is not a team that is built to handle a Joel Embiid. They're just not. They are too small. They're too slight. And yes, they do have the sort of quick perimeter athletes who can frustrate him and fluster him on doubles and whatnot. We saw like Brooklyn last year, right? That is a team that was completely undersized, but they were so long and athletic and intense and uh, just pesk-like that they forced him into a lot of turnovers and Embiid did have six turnovers in this game. But regardless, it just felt like he wasn't comfortable being as aggressive and physical as normal. Took a lot of tough twos, even if there were multiple defenders on him in a couple spots. And he was tested as a playmaker. It sort of simulated that playoff environment in some ways because you know that teams are going to test his playmaking. He's improved this year, clearly, but that has been the mold to making Joel Embiid struggle. It has been sending multiple defenders at him and seeing if he can hold up in those situations and consistently make the right decisions to protect the ball, and he hasn't. And he got a little juiced-up version of that in this game because Maxi is out, so the Philly was down a high-level offensive threat, and as great as Chet is, OKC just doesn't have anybody who can match up with him in single coverage, so they basically had to send two defenders his way, had to at least have a second defender sinking into the free throw line, uh, even if Embiid was taking a jumper. And I thought it was a solid performance on that front. I thought that he did make some solid kickouts. He also got involved running some handoffs, but you mentioned did also have a couple turnovers that were generated by that ball pressure on doubles, missed an interior pass when things were getting a little bit mucked up, was off target, committed an offensive foul in one situation. So it wasn't good on the turnover front. And he's going to have to get a lot more comfortable in two weeks. He is going to have to look like the Joel Embiid that we saw for the first couple months of this year, who was an actual superhero, but that's what this Philly team needs. The expectation for this year was not that they would be contending. It was that this was going to be a little bit of a reset. This was going to be, okay, let's see what Maxi looks like as an offensive number two. And they did a nice job of acquiring some quality wings, Batum and Oubre. But the expectations losing James Harden coming off of what was already a brutal playoff exit were not, hey, this is going to be the best Philly team that we've seen. So overall, I am not super optimistic about their playoff outlook. They have been a dominant team with Embiid on the floor this year. They're 27-8 and eight when he plays. And if they can get out of that play-in particularly, so if they can avoid Milwaukee slash Boston, I really think they can win a playoff series. I would probably pick them depending on how Embiid looks over these next couple weeks because I do think that their ceiling is higher than Cleveland's, but they still have issues because A, we don't know what version of Embiid we're going to get. B, Tyrese Maxey, as great as he was in the early stretch of this year, I think we have seen, has some issues still if he is going to be your number one option from the perimeter, particularly in the non embed stretch of the season. His efficiency just tanked. His efficiency as a pull-up shooter in particular tanked. He's 33% from mid-range this year, 32% from three. I absolutely think it was a very difficult task for him to have to carry the load like that in a non embed stretch. But the fact that we're talking about real low end efficiency, like four or five points below league average indicates that as much as I love Maxi and I've loved him forever, like he is not among the high end guards that maybe some were ready to compare him to in terms of how he can float an offense and Embiid's going to make anybody look better because he consumes so much defensive attention. So I like Maxi. I still think we need to see him hold up at that level, and they need him to be pretty damn good. We also don't know when D'Anthony Melton is going to be back, and I think he's an important role player. He's been out over a month with this back thing, and there is not, to my knowledge, a timetable on his return, and we're knocking on the door of the playoffs now. So there's questions here. Their spot-up shooting hasn't been great this year, but long-term, I really like the vision, and uh, 
I am optimistic about this team being a move or two away. I do like the ads of Batum and Oubre. I really like the healed pickup midseason. They've added some athleticism on the wings. They've added some offensive skill. They are reasonably close, but they are still clearly a tier below from a Boston. I mean, a couple of tiers below in terms of all-around talent. And Milwaukee still has a more proven dominant formula of, hey, we are going to have these two dominant basketball players in a playoff setting even if dame hasn't consistently been that great this year he's had ups and downs he's just so much more proven in that setting than maxi is so philly's a team that can win a series i'd be really surprised if they won two and the most important thing is just that mb looks like himself and can play somewhat like himself and hopefully maxi does hold up relatively well as that number two and then it's like all right we have our core together and now we can use some of these assets and use uh the picks that we got from the harden deal and get ourselves into true contention for next year what do you think that asset is like if it's on the margins or if it's a, a big swing for somebody what's the what other kind of players do you think philly needs to acquire to to realize that championship ceiling well, I think that it would be ideal for them to have a more consistent third option offensively because I don't think that Maxi is going to be at that consistent like top 15 player level that you would ideally like your number two to be at if you're trying to go on a title run or you would want to have, again, that collective of our number two and number three are both very good and they can kind of trade off having these clear star level nights like what you saw from milwaukee in 2021 where middleton and holiday were both inconsistent but they also both had their nights where they were the man and that's what that team needed so upgrading the tobias harris slot i think is probably the most impactful move that they can make because i don't think that they're gonna put another lead guard alongside maxi Although I think that that could work because we've seen that Maxi is so good off ball. He's so good in transition. He's so great as a spot up player that he is a true combo guard. And I think that he works either as a primary ball handler or as a secondary ball handler. So I think they do need another star level player offensively right now. It doesn't have to be a superstar level player, but somebody who can be a top three option for them. Yeah, I don't think they're... I don't know that far off either. And I do like the healed pickup. Uh, Ubre has been balling out of control for this team uh, in Embiid's absence. Yeah. Do you like them more than Miami? Man. I know that's I don't tough, supposed right? to answer a question like that. I think those are clearly the two most dangerous lower seeds. Mm -hmm. Although now things are getting weird because the Magic have slid in front of the Knicks. And I have my concerns about the Knicks, too, just because of health and the fact that they're uh, going to be out of rhythm as a basketball team when it comes to the playoffs. I think that they have a higher ceiling than the Heat because of the fact that Embiid can just go nuclear, but the Heat have voodoo magic, and the <laughs> Heat have two very reliable stars in these playoff environments, and they're going to defend really well, and they're going to give teams fits with their coaching. So, uh, it might be matchup dependent this year, honestly. Give me Miami. Give me Miami. Yeah, I think that probably Miami is a more uncomfortable draw, but I don't know, man. Philly was killing people earlier yeah. this season when Embiid was healthy. They were just killing people. So, I do think their ceiling because of basketball town and because of how dominant their best player can be is a little bit higher. Either way, I think it's good that Embiid is back because it doesn't feel like a lost season for mm -hmm. Philly at the same time if he has any sort of health complications because of this and also just if he really struggles in the playoffs like that's just gonna be bad for the vibes because yeah. everybody is gonna be shitting on Embiid again but the injury is the real concern because ultimately I don't think they're gonna do anything too meaningful in this year's playoff run and then it's like was it worth it to rush our best and injury prone mm -hmm. player back maybe not but if he wants to be out there when he's been having a special season when healthy who's to say that he can't be out there and it'll be interesting to see 
what they can do. The thrill and excitement of March Mania is here in DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn five bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. And North Carolina listeners, don't forget DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code NERDS. New customers can bet five bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code NERDS. The crown is yours. All right, last game from last night that we're going to touch on, Logan. I was at the Warriors played the Mavs. I got to see Luka in person for the first time. It was just a bundle of fun. My brother shared a moment with Mark Cuban. He had a business idea that he wanted to pitch him. I don't think I'm going to reveal it here because it's such a brilliant idea, but uh, they shared a moment from across the way, which was nice. And he got on TV as well. He also blue steeled on TV. Did you watch that video I sent you of Ben? blue stealing at the camera it was electric yeah like he just deadpanned well so he was cheering right oh i'm so excited i'm so excited and then he just like that it was masterful i don't believe i've heard that term before that verb blue steel have you ever seen zoolander well yeah i mean that's just like he just mean mugged him ain't it no it's not mean mugging it's this very <laughs> different i mean it, it was pretty funny it was a funny okay. clip now i'll throw you magnum <laughs> do you notice the differences no god you have no eye for male modeling no eye for male modeling whatsoever you got to review the film man anyways it was a really good basketball game though and a very important basketball game for the warriors as they fight for their play in seeding stopping a mavs team that had been very very hot what did you take away from that performance by the dubs logan i was really impressed uh one with the young guys with the defense and finally they were able to withstand a, a non-nuclear steph game i mean they won this game steph curry went for 14 points on 5 of 18 shooting and mm -hmm. just three of five from behind the arc while luca and kyrie combined for 57 points anytime the golden state warriors can win a game like this this is a massive massive win but yeah. i was really impressed with how they dealt with dallas physically uh, uh wiggins going at luca i was really impressed with him defensively and luca's one of those guys it's like iguodala going at lebron in the finals it's like you can play your defend your ass off he's gonna get what he wants and luca got what he wanted but i thought wiggins uh, i thought draymond when he got switched on uh b pods any matchup i really thought the warriors fought um this is a really prideful team and a team that when they are with their backs against the wall like they're gonna claw they're gonna fight caged animal mode and i really felt that way in this game like a lot of heart a lot of grit a lot of fight from golden state and that's what i've, I've been waiting to see you know uh they fought really hard in this game and i was impressed with that uh They've had the number two uh, defensive rating over this five-game winning streak. They have won five straight now. Um, uh, Gary Payton, too, I didn't mention him. He, I thought he was phenomenal in minutes where he got switched on to Luka. Uh, fell asleep on a backdoor cut against Kyrie, but it was a great play from Kyrie. Um, really impressed with the effort. Uh, Draymond has the monster block on Gafford late in this mm -hmm. game. Huge. It's just, Draymond makes no sense on those plays, man, because Gafford is so big. It's just like physically you're watching it as it's happening. It's like, oh man, Gafford's going to yam on him. And then Draymond somehow gets like 40 inches in the air and yeah. says, nah, Draymond doesn't make sense, man. He's truly one of the greatest defenders of all time and uh, such a huge clutch moment. You got to give a big shout out to Trace Jackson Davis and Brandon Podzimski, though, man. Both grabbed 10 boards in this game. Um, I'm perpetually disappointed in Kevon Looney. Um, it's really sad. Super uh, personal. I mean, I just, Looney minutes disappoint me, man. Uh, and TJD's just better at this point. That one, I know TJD only pull, uh, puts up four points in this one. Dude, when he turned the corner on Gafford and elevated like that, that was a oh ridiculous God. dunk, dude. Ridiculous. Yeah. TJD one he is an excellent dunker. Yeah, TJD one has way more bounce. Like I knew he was a great vertical athlete, but he he elevates. Just he just keeps going up, man. He's like an elevator, and his arms nice. are long as shit, dude. What does he have? Like a seven seven wingspan. His arms are ridiculous for a guy his size. Uh, he only puts up four points. That one dunk was crazy, but 
I want to give a huge shout out to B Pods, man. B Pods, his rebounding, 10 boards for a guard. Uh, they're plus 17 in B Pods minutes in this game. And on the year, the dubs are plus seven points for 100 possessions better with pods on the floor. Uh, five and a half points offensively and then one and a half points defensively. He just does all the little things, man. I'm so impressed with that kid and his basketball acumen and just like how he impacts the game in good decision making, defensively being where he needs to be, crashing the class hard. He's just a winner. Um, you know, the dubs are... An interesting team, man. The Dubs are a team that you just can't really count out. Like, I don't know what we're going to get with them in the playoffs. I really think it really depends on Steph Curry cranking it up another level. But yeah. there's so many other little factors game to game. The performance of the young guys, who I think are super consistent. The defensive ceiling that this team consistently reaches. The play of Andrew Wiggins. I thought Andrew Wiggins had a phenomenal game. Mm -hmm. If we can get him to reach a just a higher level consistently. And he has, man. He had one dud in these past five games, but he's consistently been around 17 or 18 a night with good defense. Uh, I thought he played an excellent game. There's so many little variables game to game that can swing games for the Warriors. Clay's shooting. Wiggins' performances offensively and defensively. The Warriors are still a very scary team, man. You know, they may be a low seed. This season may have been very, very disappointing for them. If we get superstar Steph Curry and the role players play how they can play, like, that's the thing of a championship team, man. This team knows how they need to play on a nightly basis, and I really like the effort. I really like the tenacity. I really liked how the other guys stepped up in a bad Steph game. That's the most encouraging part about this, man. The Warriors still scare me. They may be on the lower end of uh, contenders for me. There's something, man. There's something about the Dubs that, that still scares me. Again, man, with most teams, I think it's going to be very matchup dependent this season. There are so many teams that are so talented. I think matchups are going to really, uh, you know, determine how this playoff field comes out. But the Warriors still scare me, man. And they're hitting their stride as a team at the right time. I would not classify them as contenders at all. I don't think they're any level of contender. I don't think they're going to get out of the play in. But they're still fun. You don't think they could get out game. of the. You don't think they could get out of the first round. I didn't say I don't think they can't. I said I don't think they will. Could they get out of the first? If they round? get, I wouldn't take them straight up against the Lakers in the play. And I think there's a gap between those two teams. So I wouldn't that's take them step in the, one. If they sneak into the playoffs, I'd take them to win the first round. I just disagree. They're going to be in the seven or eight. They're not beating OKC. They're certainly not beating Denver. You don't think they're beating? You don't think they're beating Oklahoma City? Why would I think that? On what basis? I think, that, I think they can take Oklahoma City, man. Okay, I Golden just State's disagree. Been the OKC one, Golden is State's been the number so one. much more athletic. They're Golden more State's skilled. been the number one rebounding team in the league this year, man. That's not true. Where did you come up with that? Are you looking they're, at total rebounds? Stop looking at total rebounds. Look at rebound rate. They're still that's number like one saying, in rebounds per That's game. like saying the 1982 Nuggets are the best offense ever because they scored 125 points a game. Because they averaged 125 possessions a game. They're number three in rebound rate. Is that better? Okay. Is that better? Do you like that well, number it's more? it's more accurate, more accurate, but they're not going to bully OKC. That, that's an entirely different dynamic than talking about a Denver or even the Lakers going up where they have these super physical, huge front courts. The Dubs may win the battle on the glass, but they're small. They don't have the same physical advantages. The Thunder have significantly more dangerous offensive players the Warriors so much this year have been entirely dependent on Steph just going supernova. OKC has been much more proven defensively this year. They fly around on the perimeter. They have an elite rim protector. I think at this point, they arguably have the best player in that series. I would take SGA. But either way, they're on the same level, SGA and Steph. And then OKC is a more talented basketball team alongside their superstar, clearly. I don't know, man. I just think... You're giving the Warriors a little too much credit. I like what they're doing, but to pick them to beat OKC... I'm taking OKC to lose in the first round regardless. If God. LA gets out, if Golden State gets out, I'm taking the low seed. I think it's an entirely different dynamic if the Lakers, who have bullied OKC, proven that, have two top 10 level players have this ceiling that they have shown when they care against good teams in the in-season tournament where, like, they can look like an elite basketball team. The Warriors just haven't done that this year. 
So I think that they're pesky. Wait, also, you said last week you like the Rockets more than the Warriors. What is yeah, this? I'm taking any team to beat. Uh, you would yeah, take the Houston true. Rockets? Maybe. Shut up! You sound like an <laughs> idiot right now. This is literally the dumbest thing I've ever heard you say. Yeah. Respect OKC, dude. OKC has issues in certain matchups, but they are yeah. so good. Yeah, they're good. But you're oh just like God. completely negating the Warriors championship pedigree, bro. No, I'm not. I'm valuing it and I'm respecting it. I'm also living in the year 2024, man. Where last season, it was an absolute war and took Steph being a superhero for them to get past the Kings in the first round in seven. OKC is way, way better than that Kings team. Way better. Anyways, let me talk about the basketball game that I was at last night between the Golden State Warriors <laughs> and the Dallas Mavericks, who also are clearly a better team than them. But this was a good win for the Dubs. And what has been encouraging about this five-game win streak is that they're finally winning games where Steph doesn't have to be this overwhelming offensive force. They beat Miami without Jimmy. Not super impressive, but Steph only has 17 in that game. They beat Orlando, legit playoff team, on the road, where Steph has 17 on 6 of 18 shooting. And then they win last night, where Steph is really, obviously not a non-factor because of just how he changes the dynamics of offense simply by being out there. But as a shot maker, he was really off, and he was soundly outplayed by Luka. But it was a strong collective offensive performance. CP3 was just doing his vintage stuff dictating offense with the second unit and really did a great job of floating things in those minutes getting to his spots from the mid-range making good decisions as a playmaker even knocked down a couple threes won his minutes by a good amount Wiggins was the hero of the day though he was super aggressive offensively attacking the rim also knocking down triples and confidently stepping into those shots not doing any of the Andrew Wiggins disappearing act and he played a really good game defensively even Draymond was aggressive offensively down the stretch. And the Warriors shot really well from deep. They were 15 of 32. So that's the formula that they need if they do want to survive the play. And if they do want to give somebody an uncomfortable first round series, they need more from people other than Steph offensively. And they need to have a chance to survive nights where Steph isn't a superhero. And the other big component that is just how well they've been defending as of late. They're winning these games Sure, because other guys are stepping off offensively, but more so because they are playing at a very high level defensively. And you really felt their perimeter athleticism all game in this one. I mean, it is quite the combination of guys who they can throw out there. Wiggins does a really good job on Luka, and I thought was applying ball pressure and was disciplined and was dealing with the physicality. One of the things that's so fun about watching basketball games in person, especially if you're lucky enough to be like relatively up close, is just how much you see the physicality, man. Every single Luka drive, there are so many bumps. There are so many little changes in gears and little chicken wings and just like everything these guys can do to create a little separation to get a little bit of an edge it is such a physical physical sport and that's not always reflected in the same way on tv but all the dubs perimeter defenders held up well there gb2 i thought draymond i had just his eagle eye going on a couple of plays early where luca forecasted a pass a little bit and draymond jumped it forced a turnover so they did a really good job on Luca, which is why it's ridiculous that he still ended up with 30, 12, and 11 on good efficiency because that's just what the guy does no matter what. But they forced him into some tough shots. He made some tough shots. He's Luka Doncic. That's what he does. Every single shot from him is so impressive in person. And the Mavs did create some good shots down the stretch. Those guard on guard screens with Luka and Kyrie were a little bit dangerous. And I thought that those guys dissected the traps relatively well and created some. Pretty good looks from three, but Draymond was flying around, contesting those shots. Wiggins was flying around as well, showing his athleticism. So they made life hard on Dallas just by how hard they competed and because of their quickness. With these small ball looks, they just have so many dudes who are extremely mobile. And then Draymond did his superhuman stuff defensively. I mean, that block on Gafford, just absolutely ridiculous threatens Kyrie from floater range and then also recovers to the guy who has five inches on him in the dunker spot and uh, just an unbelievable block to meet him at the apex and then final possession of the game dubs are up four but absolutely clamped Kyrie I mean Kyrie's initial attempt to create any separation Draymond was all over him and then he got it back and just 
trapped him in that corner and he had to put up a three that like hit the side of the backboard so this team has a lot of fight they have a lot of dog they're defending their asses off and that defense is huge to the formula it was huge to the formula of the 2022 title team it's going to be huge to determining how far this team can go because they aren't going to explode offensively that often they just don't have a ton of offensive skill but uh i was going to ask you if you flipped on your warriors rockets take because I thought the Warriors were clearly better. I think the Warriors are clearly better. Yes, I was caught up in the moment. Yeah, all right. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong but with look, that. But look, dude, if if the Lakers can somehow leapfrog and get into that 7-6 matchup and avoid goal, because, I mean, I don't think the Lakers this are going to lose to Golden State. He's jumping through hoops. You are the problem. You are big media. You are Lakers, Warriors, obsessed big media. Yes! Canceling you How can it. you not be, bro? Bro, you're literally a Kings fan. Yeah, but the Kings suck. We lost oh Malik Monk. God. It's yeah, over. It it's over. over. Yeah, it is over when you don't have Malik Monk. I don't know, man. I mean, the Lakers do get to play the Wizards again, so they are And I are, love the uh, Warriors, man. Steam. How can you not want them in the playoffs? I'm a That's Warriors for... fan. That's good for ball. I am a Warriors fan. I'm also just looking at the reality of the situation here, and it probably is going to be Lakers-Warriors in the 9-10, and I think the Lakers are significantly better in that situation. Would you rather see the Suns and the Kings in the playoffs or the Lakers and the Warriors? What are you talking about? They're not a collective. It's not the Lakers and the Warriors. The Lakers are clearly the best of all those teams, in my opinion. The Kings... Uh... Suck. Stink. Dude, you are Mr. Negative. You are Mr. Anti-Small Market. No, the Kings don't suck, but they don't really scare me. And uh, with Herder done for the year... But more importantly, with Malik done for the year, the Kings would be the weakest of those teams. Mm -hmm. But I think the Suns scare me a little bit more than the Warriors, just because if you get unreal book and KD for a series, and if the Suns just, like, grind defensively and compete there like they should be capable of, I'm not saying, like, the, you know, they have the tools to be a great defense, but we've seen stretches where it's like, hey, they've got athletes on the perimeter, they can be fine. I mean, that's just a better basketball team than the Warriors. The Warriors just, like, aren't that good, dude. They're scrappy. They are a scrappy team. That's what they are, and there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not a team that's going to win multiple playoff series. And I was wrong. Early in the year, I thought, hey, this is a top-four team in the West. I love this bench. They have Steph Curry. They have Draymond Green. What more could they need? And it turns out they need more offensive skill. And in certain matchups, they need more size. And I think we can accept that reality. I'm not ready, man. All right, dude. Anyways, when it comes to the Mavs, what I saw from them, Luka, in person, incredible. I mentioned the physicality. I mentioned the pace, the deception, dude, on so many of the possessions, just all the little things that he does to get an angle, the ball fakes. Uh, it's incredible. And then his variety as a shot maker is just absurd. I mean, he's shooting these turnarounds. He's shooting a pump fake into a fadeaway over Gary Payton. I mean, the step backs, it's like in person, you think every single one of them is going to fall. His touch is so obscenely good. It was really fun just to see him out there. And you really do feel how much bigger and more athletic Dallas is in the front court. Like, there's just several plays a game. Derek Jones Jr., PJ Washington, obviously Gafford totally changes the dynamics around the rim, having a big of that caliber and that size for 48 minutes. They didn't have Lively in this game, but... In the playoffs, they'll have both of them out there. This does feel like a much improved Dallas defense, and I thought that they defended well in this game. But even seeing a loss in person, I still really like the formula for these guys. I really like it. I will say, Derek Jones Jr. starting, probably not ideal. P.J. Washington was aggressive in this game. He was putting up his little runners and floaters, and he was letting them rip from deep. And I don't have a problem with him being aggressive because somebody other than Luka and Kyrie kind of has to be on this team. You got to take the opportunities given to them. But I think Dallas is shaping up pretty darn nicely for the playoffs. They're also silly, man. They're silly. On their bench pregame, they had this one guy. I don't know if he was security. I don't know if he was an assistant coach. I thought he was clearly Yugoslav, uh, perhaps a Slovenian, perhaps one of Luka's boys. He was carrying Markeith Morris fireman style on his shoulders, and Markeith was gleeful about it. Then he comes up, and he starts, like, wrestling with Dwight Powell. Dwight Powell, who wears these goofy-ass goggles pregame. They're just a silly team. By the way, Markeith is literally a coach. Like, he's standing the entire game on the bench, 
There was one point where Jay Kidd and Luca were like having a little one on one, and Markeith was just like leaning in, nodding his head. He was the only other guy there. Markeith Morris, coach, Dallas Mavericks, vibes guy, hype man. Has That's he his reached, title. He's reached Unk status. It seems like it, dude. It seems like it. I think he's looking to have that. Let me get another five years on NBA contracts when I don't actually play a minute, but just because I'm a leader. So those are my takeaways. Logan is apparently devastated that the Warriors aren't going to win the title this year. He had the Warriors at plus 20,000 to win the title. Oh, and now he's mewing. Now he's mewing. <laughs> Let's talk about this football news, Logan, because it does involve my Buffalo Bills. Diggsy is going to the Texans along with a fifth rounder and a sixth rounder for a 2025 second round pick. What's your reaction to this deal? Everybody blows Bill's news and anything relating to Josh Allen news way out of proportion. Like, mm. there's just never a middle ground with Josh Allen or the Bills, man. Uh, the Bills' Super Bowl window is not closed. Buffalo had a major overhaul this offseason. That is true. They lost a lot of veterans. They're going to be fine. And as Carson uh, liked to remind us during the NFL season last year, uh, Diggs was not playing like a number one in the back half of this season and in the playoffs. From after week 10, this is an eight-game sample size, half of a season, Diggs averaged 43.6 receiving yards per game. He had 37 catches for 349 yards and a touchdown. For reference, that is way outside the top 25 and the 30 of the top receivers in that span. He was not playing like a number one. And then in the playoffs, he had a good game versus Pittsburgh. Uh, and then against the Chiefs, he had three catches for 21 yards on eight targets. And the play that we're all going to remember from that mm -hmm. game is the ball going through his hands on that shot play where Josh Allen delivered a uh, perfect Dime. pass. Yeah. And uh, what all coaches will tell you, what all football people will tell you, if it hits you in the hands, you better catch it. There's no excuses. you got to catch that ball. And I think they got great value for Stefan Diggs. This is a guy who's not getting any better. He is 31 years old. He has apparently been disgruntled for all of the last three to four uh, off seasons. Again, I don't know if there's merit to those rumors. We've dispelled them for some time, but normally when there's smoke, there's fire. Mm -hmm. You got a second round pick for that guy. Again, a guy who is not getting any better. He is on the decline now. You're going to have to pay him again if you want to hold on to him. This is phenomenal value for a wide receiver. Now, you mentioned this, Carson, I believe in a tweet, or you texted me. Uh, you said it would have been much nicer to have in this year's draft, obviously, where you could replace him immediately. And I quite like this year's receiving class, where if you could couple that pick with another later round pick and move into the first round and get one of the top guys and get a number one, or where you could just take another second round guy. Again, I really like this year's receiving class. It's a second round pick. That's great value, man. Again, you're not going to have to pay him. Uh, you're not going to have this. Josh Allen has been the second best quarterback in football for some time now behind Patrick Mahomes. One of the best offensive engines in football up there with Mahomes, with Burrow, with Lamar. And it doesn't matter. You know, I'm not saying that Stefan Diggs doesn't matter. He was great. Him and Josh were a great QB wideout duo. But when you have a quarterback of this caliber, I am of the belief that you can give him Joe Schmo, and he's going to make him good. He made, he got Gabe Davis paid this last offseason, man. Do you know how hard it is to get Gabe Davis paid? Mm. Like, yes, there's a lot of change, and change is scary because we don't know what the outcome is going to be when there's a lot of change. So, there, yes, there's a lot of variables, and there's a lot of moving parts here with the Buffalo Bills offseason. But you know what part that is staying? It's the main cog of the machine, and his name is Josh Allen, and the Bills are going to be fine. They're going to win the AFC East. They're going to make the playoffs, and guess what? We're probably going to get Bills Chiefs again if Josh Allen stays healthy. So we can all stay away from the panic button. The Bills are going to be fine, and in my humble opinion, I think they absolutely crush this trade. To get a second-round mm -hmm. pick for an aging receiver is a home-run hit. I think the Bills crushed this. I think they've done a very good job this offseason. I think a lot of this is getting blown out of proportion, and I think the Bills are going to be a very, very good football team next year and a Super Bowl contender. It's really surprised me, the reaction to all this stuff, which is, 
the sky is falling and the bills are rebuilding. And I do think it speaks to some people being a bit removed from the specifics of what's going on in Buffalo, right? Trey White, I love the guy, but he's an aging corner who can't stay healthy. Shout out Micah Hyde. Shout out Jordan Poyer. Both aging and regressing old safeties. And now you're talking about Diggs, who, like, yeah, has been a bedrock of this offense for years, but also took a step back this year. And you mentioned over the last 12 games of the year, dude, two-thirds of the season, he was outproduced by both Khalil Shakir and Dalton Kincaid. Of course, he's still the number one receiver. He's still demanding number one receiver attention, but he wasn't playing like one of the elite receivers in football. And the notion that he isn't replaceable in this current form with some first round receiver in this year's loaded class at a much better dollar value that just doesn't make sense to me the scary thing is Diggs, even if he's not the player that he was a couple years ago is a sure thing it is a sure thing that he's a number one receiver and uh, you could always miss in the draft you could say hey these first round receivers are so great the hit rate on them is high in recent years but you could always be the guy who takes Jalen Rager you could always be let's the take, guy who takes Corey Coleman let's take you Quentin always, Johnston you man. could always be the guy who takes Quentin Johnson and that's the scary thing but I still think that this is the right move because ultimately this is the direction of this Bills team this is the theme of the offseason and this is what I wanted the theme of the offseason to be. Shedding these big names who are old, who in some cases have health concerns. That's not really the case for Diggsy, but are just generally trending downwards and getting younger and getting better value because that's going to be the theme of this Josh Allen era. It's going to be about value propositions. You have your superstar quarterback with a big cap hit and he can restructure and do whatever as he did this year, but it's going to be about value and paying the right people appropriate amounts. And I just think that Diggs' contract at his age, considering that there is lingering drama there, it exceeds his actual value on the football field at this point. So they have to nail receiver in the first round. I think that that is absolutely essential. And uh, overall, I mean, they're just going to have to keep drafting well, right? That is why I'm not as high on the value as you are, Logan. I'm okay with it. But I really would prefer a second rounder to be this year because I like the vision of, hey, all right, we have these older, expensive dudes. We're going to move off of them. And so maybe they aren't the best value propositions at this stage in this career, but they're still good football players. And you have to replace those good football players. And I'd like to do that this offseason because the Bills want to win every single year. The Bills' expectation every single year is win the division, win a playoff game, if not more. So having to wait a year to reap the rewards of losing a guy who, even if he took a step back, is still one of your best players, that's where I don't love it. And attaching a fifth and a sixth, I, it's not the best value but I like the vision broadly and I don't hate the value. So overall, I think people who are viewing this as a major loss for the Bills are missing the bigger picture. I'm not even sure that the relationship between Diggs and Allen and the organization was really tenable for that much longer. Like last year, I tried to say, oh, this stuff is overblown. But I think throughout this year, like you can only see Trayvon Diggs talk about how his brother wants a trade and should come to Dallas so many times. And you can only see so many sub tweets from Diggs before you're like, all right, obviously uh, there is not just smoke, there is fire here. And that just kind of seems to be the reality with Diggs. It's like you get a couple years and then he's like, all right, I'm done with you. It doesn't matter if he's playing with a top two quarterback. It doesn't matter if he has an overwhelming target share as he did for three and a half years. He's going to be pissed. But that's the thing. When the offense became less dig centric, when it wasn't all about the Allen Diggs connection, when they started to lean more on the running game and Shakir and Dalton Kincaid, the offense was running smoothly. The offense was humming. So it doesn't have to be all about digs. And I think that there was value in seeing how the offense could thrive, not without him, but without him doing as much as he had been when you're talking about moving to a future without him. And on the biggest stage, who was the guy that let him down? The ball yeah. went through Diggs' hands. Like, yeah. I'm not no, saying, true. you know, I'm not putting all this on him, but it's also like, you got to be that guy that wears a little bit more of the loss. Um, yeah. And also, Josh is just going to elevate anybody, dude. Yeah. That's the reality with these great quarterbacks, right? I saw somebody compare it to, like, 2015 Cam, the Bills' current receiving core. 
And it does look that way. I mean, it's Curtis Samuel right now and Khalil Shakir competing to be wide receiver one. They're going to take a receiver high in the draft, but that is the current situation. But I just think Josh does so much to stress a defense. It's like what we've seen with Lamar in recent years, right? The weapons improved this year, but even when they weren't great, he is just such a freak talent that he is going to carry that offense. And mm-hmm. you need to put the right pieces around that guy to reach their ceiling. Maybe if you want to win the Super Bowl with anybody other than Patrick Mahomes, and even in his case, then you need to give him an elite defense to compensate for that lack of elite offensive talent. But the notion that this team that has a good defensive infrastructure, that has the resources to uh, replenish some of these positions, and that overall is moving off of players who weren't at their peaks is just going to fall off a cliff is incorrect. The Bills are probably going to win this division. They're probably going to win a playoff game because they have Josh Allen and... uh, that's the biggest thing. And they have a good defensive coach and good defensive personnel. Yeah. On the flip side of this, I, I'm I'm not scratching my head about Houston doing this, but I don't fully understand it. Um, I, I do think Stefan's going to come in here and be the number one. But, I, I mean, I really liked Nico Collins last oh, year. Yeah. I thought Nico balled out. Uh, I really liked Tank Dell last year. And so – I don't know. Wide receiver wasn't really a position I thought of like super high need for Houston, but I understand getting a another reliable presence, another guy that's going to take uh, number one responsibilities, hopefully open up the rest of the field. And, you know, Stroud's a great quarterback. He's going to utilize Stefan. Uh, it, when Diggs is open, he's going to find him. You know what I mean? Stroud's just uh, awesome. He's elite. And so he's going from one elite quarterback to another. And I think he's going to eat in Houston my thing is when you're giving up a second round pick it's exactly what you said about the money Uh, a lot of this comes down to money decisions right if the Chargers could have held on to Keenan Allen and Mike Williams in the offseason they would have but those Mm -hmm. guys had 20 million dollar plus cap hits and that's where I come down with an issue with Houston it's not about the talent level that Diggs is at or really the need or you know the availability it's more about the money that they're gonna have to pay Diggs in the futures if you want him to stick around and have not just given up a second round pick for nothing you are going to have to pay digs. And I just don't know about paying an aging receiver 15, $20 million plus at this backstage of his career. When we know that slope is really dangerous when it hits, man, it's tough. I think it's overblown in some scenarios and obviously every player is different, but that 29, 30, 31 year old mark for running backs and wideouts is a very scary one. And Dix looked like he had taken a little bit of a step back, man. So it really comes down to the money for me about paying digs in the future uh, and where I'm worried about it for Houston. But it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt going out and getting another weapon for your star quarterback. And uh, I think he's going to be very successful in Houston as well, man. So I think it's a little bit of a win-win on both sides. But if you're asking me who won the trade, I think Buffalo did. I think they got better value back. Oh, wow. I am a lot higher on this trade for Houston than you are for a few reasons I really like their receiver situation too I was beyond pleasantly surprised with the play of Nico Collins and Tank Dell last year I still don't think you can go wrong adding more star receiver talent to support your star young quarterback like I just think they're putting CJ in a position to crush it I also think these are two teams that are in very different situations just Mm. in terms of their freedom to allocate cap largely because one player has a top 10 quarterback on a rookie deal the other one has a superstar quarterback but he is on a massive deal and so houston is in a position where i think they still had like 30 million in cap before taking on this digs deal and you're talking about trading him for nothing but they have control of him through 2027 if they want so that's three years and and that's kind of the perfect out because then i wouldn't give him another contract at that point he's too old they can also, I didn't realize this, they can cut him after this season and yeah, all an of his dead cap. They have an out. So I like it, and I don't think the value in terms of draft capital is too much. You give up a second next year, you get back a fifth and a sixth on top of this star player. I just don't see why Houston wouldn't do it. Like, they have their foundational young pieces. Nico Collins, CJ Stroud, Derek Stingley, Will Anderson, these guys who are just bona fide studs. And they don't have to pay any of them like elite players yet. So why wouldn't you go out and get a Daniil Hunter? Why wouldn't you go out and get a Stefan Diggs? I just think that's a great approach to this offseason. And this team is terrifying, 
right now. They're terrifying. I think that they have one of the most imposing duos of pass rushers in football. I think that they are incredibly well coached. Now they have one of the best receiving cores and this incredibly gifted ascending young quarterback. Houston is going to win the division. Jacksonville just does not scare me like they do. I know Anthony Richardson is coming back and what have you. Like This team is pretty loaded, dude. And I think if anybody's going to make some noise, obviously Kansas City yeah. and Baltimore are just absolutely loaded. But outside of that, Bal- B- Buffalo still has to be in that conversation. Healthy Cincinnati has to be in that conversation. But Houston might be number three in the AFC. And so when you're in a position to add star talent, and it doesn't really hurt you against the cap in a meaningful way, I just say go ahead and do it. And that's where Houston is, and that's a fun spot to be for a couple years because windows change fast in the NFL, and you should always be stockpiling talent when you have the opportunity to to give yourself a puncher's chance for that year or two, whatever it may be, and Houston's done that. Yeah, uh, the AFC is going to be cutthroat. Um, Yeah. I don't know. I'm not ready to make any, like, big time. Obviously, Kansas City is at the top of my hierarchy right now. With Baltimore, Baltimore, and they're still my one and two. The AFC is going to be a war for the next five years, man. We talked about this a lot, but Stroud, Trevor Lawrence, mm-hmm. uh, Rodgers is in the division for this year, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson, all of the top quarterback talent in the AFC. Of course, Russell Wilson, you know, uh, <laughs> all of the top quarterback talent is in the AFC right now. Mm-hmm. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a battle year in year out. Uh, I obviously say Russell Wilson tongue in cheek, but I mean yes, one of your classic jests. Low jokester is back at it, folks. It's uh, it's gonna be a battle, man. Um, and the Texans now have upgraded their firepower. Uh, yeah, the Texans are scary, man. The Texans are scary. I do think it's their division, and ironically, man, they have completely leapfrogged Jacksonville. It's, yeah. it's so funny to me. It's the Urban Meyer ripple effect, in my opinion, man. <laughs> I'm serious. You took away uh, T-Law's rookie year, like a real rookie year under a real head coach and a real coordinator with a real team. Uh, and, you know, it's just it's just taken a lot to rebuild and, and to get back to that point. You know, you started in a negative hole, and the Texans have leapfrogged them. And Indianapolis, too, is going to be a tough out. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it Jacksonville may have gotten done in by two teams in their division. And I think Houston is the front runner, man. Uh, the Texans are a real a real contender out in the AFC, as are a lot of teams. That's why I say it's wide open next year. But Houston's for real. Houston's very for real. Yeah, dude. And I mean the depth of weapons. Noah Brown, Dalton Schultz, also on the defensive front, adding to Nico Autry this year. Like, they've had a hell of an offseason, man. They had the toys to play with, and they have taken advantage of it so far. And we haven't even gotten to the draft yet, man. So it'll be fun to see what they do there as well. So with that, as always, appreciate you guys. Hope you enjoyed this episode. That's going to do it for us here today. If you want more Nerd Sesh content, you can always find it across social media platforms. We have our trivia stuff, clips from the show. You can also listen to the show across audio platforms or You can watch our full shows on YouTube. We also do some video essay, video breakdown content there on the NBA. I'm going to do one about this Jokic-Wemby rematch just because it was incredible. So if you want some more in-depth analysis on that with some visual pairing, that will be up tomorrow. And uh, if you want our merch, Logan's hat, you can buy the hat right off Logan's head at thevolume.com. You can also get the flags that we have behind us. Check that out if you're interested. And if you want to join our Discord The link to that is at the link tree in our social media bios. So with that, as always, appreciate you guys. I've been Carson Brever. I have been Logan Camden. And this was Nerd Sash. (laughs) 